A while ago, I read an article in The Guardian titled The Arabian Nights, the last set of fairy tales that just might have a chance of being real. It was about how our overexposure to European folklore has made it lose all its magic. This is from the article. The truth is, we're spoiled in a lot of Europe. You don't have to go very far to stumble into a castle and find a gift shop inside. And all the cute thatch half-timbered houses are down the road from the apartment blocks. The effect is similar to finding out your card was up Houdini's sleeve the whole time. It's still a good trick, but the magic is a little bit tarnished by knowing it's an illusion. While I may not physically share the author's European heritage as far as location and ancestry are concerned, since I was born in the Middle East, as a kid who grew up watching his aunt's extensive CD collection of Disney animated films, but whose interest in them waned as he got older, I can definitely sympathize with his sentiment. In contrast, despite my own cultural heritage, I still find Middle Eastern fairy tales strangely alluring compared to many other stories. It is true, we are spoiled in a lot of Europe. And strange as it might sound, I suspect that people in the East suffer from largely the same Orientalism as Westerners do. I don't blame Hollywood for our stereotypes, nor do I honestly think of the fascination with the East as a great malady. This fascination is not unique to the West. The human fascination with the unfamiliar and the exotic is universal. And it is not necessarily just an evil of colonialism. Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, a Chinese film, is one of my favorite movies of all time. In the movie, Jen Yu, a girl from a rich family, basically a princess for the purposes of this fairy tale, is attached to her mother's jade comb. On a journey in the desert, the caravan is raided by some bandits. The bandit leader Lo snatches the comb from her hand and she ends up pursuing him on horseback in order to retrieve the comb. All this trouble for a comb? It's mine. It means a lot to me. A barbarian like you wouldn't understand. I can use it to pick fleas from my horse. This conversation is illustrative of Jen's worldview. The comb is emblematic of culture and refinement, and it is by extension Jen's property. It belongs to Jen. But the uncultured bandit is unable to understand either of those. Lo, however, knowing better, mocks Jen's naivete, by reducing the comb to its least dignified practical function. After a dramatic chase and some very suggestive wrestle fighting, they both fall to the ground exhausted. In the next scene, Jen wakes up in the bandit's lair. Lo offers her food. She eats voraciously, like a beast. He offers her a hot bath in privacy, singing in the distance to reassure her. The unexpected act of kindness on the part of a bandit leaves a profound impression on Jen. Suddenly, the world that was once binary and in which safety lay with her parents while the outside represented Peru begins to take on a much more ambivalent color. The desert becomes a vast realm of the unexplored, where the imagination could roam unrestrained, and where every wish, however impossible, could conceivably come true. But by the same token, that world is also revealed as treacherous and hostile to a girl who can't fend for herself. Lo urges Jen to go back to her family who are searching for her. Recognizing his deficiencies, he promises to make his mark on the world, and only then ask for Jen's hand. He tells her about a legend. We have a legend. Anyone who dares to jump from the mountain, God will grant his wish. Long ago, a young man's parents were ill, and so he jumped. He didn't die. He wasn't even hurt. He floated away, far away, never to return. He knew his wish had come true. The elders say a faithful heart will make wishes come true. The story of Genesis can be seen as a parallel representation to the idea of the lost world of imagination. In Genesis, Adam and Eve are made conscious of the duplexity of human goodness and wickedness by eating fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Jen is taught martial arts by Jade Fox, a criminal and renegade of the warrior order of Wudang Mountains. Fox has murdered her master, who though refused to teach her on account of her sex, he nevertheless had no qualms about sleeping with her, and whose death delivered by the hands of a woman she considered poetic justice. <laughs> Fox steals secret manuals containing advanced techniques from the Wudang Mountains, but she's unable to decipher them. Being a fugitive, she ends up entering Jen's house disguised as her governess, where she discovers Jen's incredible talent. The girl, it turns out, can read the manuals, and soon she even surpasses Fox in skill. Jen, of course, being only a child, becomes emotionally attached to her governess and instructor. Like Eve, however, she has to swallow bitter fruit when she finally registers Fox's indifference to her weighed against her vendetta toward Wudang warriors, and her hateful realization sends her tumbling down the slopes of cruel reality. In a manic headspace, she steals Green Destiny, a priceless sword, and engages in lawlessness. This attracts the attention of Li Mubai, a legendary Wudang swordmaster and the former owner of Green Destiny. 
and Chu Lian, his loyal companion and repressed lover. Mu Bai has his own agenda of instructing Jen, seeing that she is a prodigy. But his interest in her solely as a prospective disciple only exasperates Jen. This marks the second of Jen's discoveries. All the people in her world view her as an object in some way or other. Her aristocratic parents wish to hand her over in marriage in order to improve their standing. Lo's infatuation with her, genuine though it may be, ultimately stems from an idealistic image of her as an indomitable beast and his desire to conquer her and own her as an exotic trophy. Mubai could care less about who he will instruct, so long as they have the requisite talent. The human itself is just a vessel. Even Xu Lian, in whom she thinks she will find a last friend, is only concerned with her as a nuisance that needs to go away. Jen calls her friend and sister, but Xu Lian, whose jealousy has been aroused by Mubai's interest in Jen, renounces her when she refuses to cooperate by making her existence less felt. You're working together to set me up. I'm leaving. How dare you accuse us? I always knew you had stolen the sword. I've done nothing but protect you and your family, and you've repaid me with nothing but contempt. Li Mubai himself spared you, and all you do is insult him. You wanted some peace, and you have ruined it all. You're no sister of mine. What do I care? Friendship is not real anyway. But I wonder how long you could last as my enemy. Jen tries to force her way out, but is stopped by Xu Lian. A long, drawn-out fight ensues. Xu Lian, who possesses superior skill, which Jen finds out about in a single exchange, attempts to subdue her by striking with the blunt of the sword and trying to disarm or submit her, and eventually manages it. But Jen's indignation, rather than being quelled, grows mightier, her breathing more labored, and abandoning pity and scruples, wounds Xu Lian when she lets her guard down. Li Mubai enters and is greeted with an injured Xu Lian and Jen ready to deliver the finishing blow. He exclaims, you don't deserve the green destiny. Jen flees into the bamboo forest, pursued by Mubai. I only let you go because I wanted to see the real you. What do you know about a true heart? They fight, dancing on bamboo trees. Mubai light and graceful, only sparring, and Jen clumsy in comparison and aware of her weakness. What do you want? What I've always wanted, to teach you. All right, if you can take back the sword in three moves, I'll go with you. Mubai takes back the sword in just one move and demands that she kneel and acknowledge him as her master. When Jen refuses, he casts the sword into the river, declaring that she has no use for it. Jen dives into the water after the sword. Mubai again follows after her and sees Jade Fox snatch her floating body off the river before they disappear into the thickets. Jen comes to in a cave, disoriented and drowsy, attended by Jade Fox. There's a peculiar odor in the cave. Your parents will never accept you again, Fox says. We'll be our own masters, she says. You'll always be my lady, she says. But the betrayal has already saturated the air. Fox exits, content with her preparations. At a few minutes later, Mubai walks into his cavernous trap. A feverish Jen reveals her torso to him, saying, Is it me or the sword you want? He perceives that the girl has been drugged and gives her smelling herbs to restore her, inquiring about her now former master and accomplice. When Xu Lian and her escort also enter, Fox launches her ambush. Poisonous needles fly, most deflected by the warrior's swords, and Fox receives a fatal stab delivered by Mubai's hand. But one needle finds its mark on Mubai's neck. You deserve to die, Fox says, as her final words. But the life I was hoping to take was Jen's. She turns to her. Ten years I devoted to you, but you deceived me. You hid the manual's true meaning. I never improved, but your progress was limitless. You know what poison is? An eight-year-old girl full of deceit. Jen, my only family, my only enemy. As a trickster's life force fades, it dawns on the girl. Jen is the bane. She is the dragon who injects others with their venom to find relief from it. Like tree, like fruit. Dutiful daughter, helpless sister, renegade, temptress, student. All the characters dissolve to reveal the artless flesh. If only I had a mother for whom I should be merely a living human piece, a piece of herself, a trampled, smothered, cast-off piece. And though I were driving the nails into the cross or being nailed to it, for perhaps it is the same, 
she would hear what no one else could hear. Yevgeny Zamyatin writes it as masterpiece, We. Contrite and desperate to undo the damage she has caused, Jen rushes to fetch the antidote. But she is too late. Mubai expires in Chulian's arms. Before he draws his last breath, Chulian pleads with him to use his dying moments to meditate so he can enter Nirvana. Don't waste your last breath on me, she says. Mubai replies, I want to tell you with my last breath I have always loved you. I would rather be a ghost drifting by your side as a condemned soul than enter heaven without you. Finding Shulian embracing Mubai's lifeless form, an atrophied Jen kneels to receive her just penalty. Shulian symbolically swings the sword and stops it just short of her neck. Then she puts the pin in her hair, in doing so, returning her dignity. And having been an actor herself her whole life, bequeaths to her to no longer act a part. Promise me one thing. Whatever path you take in this life, be true to yourself. Jen reunites with Lo in Wudang, and they spend the night together. The next morning, Jen asks him if he remembers the legend of the young man he relayed to her so long ago. A faithful heart makes wishes come true, Lo says. She then asks him to make a wish. He wishes to be back in the desert, together again. But the wish is impossible. The veils have been lifted, and the unmuddied innocence of the desert is forever lost. Jen jumps. She doesn't die. She isn't even hurt. She floats away, far away, never to return. They know their wish has come true. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started, and know the place for the first time. When the last of Earth left to discover is that which was the beginning, at the source of the longest river, the voice of the hidden waterfall, and the children in the apple tree, not known because not looked for, but heard, half heard, in the stillness between two waves of the sea. T.S. Eliot. As a child, Jen dreams of adventures. She tells Julien on their first meeting she wishes to be like the heroes in the books she reads. That part of her is not an act. Julien warns her that the freedom she romanticizes may not be as charming on the inside as it seems on the outside. She conjures up examples of discomforts endured by the warriors, such as flea-ridden beds and not being able to bathe for long stretches of time. She also shows her green destiny and tells of its 400-year-long history of violence, saying once the sword has been tainted by blood, its beauty is dulled and no longer so admirable. Regardless of the warning, however, Jen is lured in with the beauty of the instrument. With her arranged marriage fast approaching, she is running out of time. She expresses her fear to Shulian. I'm getting married soon, but I haven't lived the life I want. While her adventure lasts, Jen manages to escape from her mundane existence. But she burns too bright too quickly. And by the end of the movie, she sees only the blood and not the splendor. Some people like to try new things, and some stick with the old. To the former, the desert is not a place which is constant and material, but rather an idea. And they are involved in this hopeless chase where no matter how much ground they cover, the mirage always eludes them. For the latter, the desert, though not mobile, is continually shrinking and descending into its own depths like quicksand. There's a hint here and an oasis there, but ultimately, the remembrance will outlast the experience. There's an episode on the sitcom How I Met Your Mother, where one of the main cast of characters, Marshall, drags his friends from Burger Place to Burger Place throughout New York City on a quest to relocate the, quote, best burger in the world. He stumbled into the burger joint on his first week in New York and has since been unable to find it again. He tells his friend Robin, just a burger, just a burger. Robin, it's so much more than just a burger. I mean, that first bite. What heaven that first bite is. This is no mere sandwich of grilled meat and toasted bread, Robin. This is God speaking to us in food. The episode ends with Marshall finding the best burger and liking it just as much as the first time. But we know that the only realistic scenario would be if he was disappointed. With some luck, or perhaps faith, 
Maybe there will be a realm of the exotic out there still waiting for us. Or if not, we must content ourselves with the fugitive oases. But we won't stop looking, because we won't know until we take the plunge. If you want to watch more videos like this, please subscribe to the channel. If you want to support the channel, the best way to do that would be to share it with your friends. Thank you for listening. Thank <laughs> you.